Ja, hallo Kaya. Hallo. We have an interview in English for your English friends and your English speaking friends. Okay, we try the best. We try our best. Okay. So, do you have any sense of your uh, teaching that you can put in words? Yes. Actually, there's no teaching. It's more pointing. Uh, um, a pointing to the essential, to who you are, to who you really are, and exploring that. So it's more actually pointing out how to explore that what we really are. And this exploration, and, um, my teaching, so to say, or the satsangs that I'm holding, are not that I teach people, but to show them how to explore the essence. Because the essential is present everywhere for everybody. And we, it's not that I'm a teacher or the master or the guru. It's more exploring together. How does the exploring practically are going to happen? To happen? So mostly when the satsang starts, I invite people to sit silently a little bit and to investigate what they are noticing when they come in contact with their sensations of touch. For example, you, you now right now you touch with your feet the ground or with your sitting bones and the chair myself the same, and to come in contact just with that sensation, which is not who I am, that's something I am aware of. And mostly what happens for many people, or for those people that have no stored traumata that they had with the ground from a bicycle accident or whatever, notice something calms down, they can relax. And then mostly I speak a little bit about whatever comes in that moment, some experience, some recognition, some, some things what I find right now interesting to speak about. And then I start to invite the people for exploring some themselves and not take me as an entertainer or take me as a teacher who's holding a lecture. Because all this, or many of these wisdom is written in many books. But then it's a second hand knowing if we take this wisdom. But when we explore for ourselves, then there's this direct experience. And this is something I cannot really... Nobody can take it, because it's explored by myself, so to say. Does it make any sense for you when you listen to me? <laughs> yes. yes. Um... And the exploration uh, is happening in the way that I ask myself who I am? This can be one way. Um, some people ask me, what is my lineage or my spiritual lineage? And actually, there is not really a spiritual lineage, but 
if we want to speak about it like that, then it would be the lineage of Ramana Maharshi and Papaji and Isaac, which are my teachers, so to say. And even though they didn't teach anything to me, but I learned something very special from them. And uh, Ramana somehow was the first one in this modern world, so to say, who was meditating with this question, who are you or who am I? And was also asking the people that approached him for liberation or enlightenment to find out who are you? Who is the one who wants enlightenment? And is the one who wants enlightenment really you? So this can be one approach. And in um, any but case. Yes, can I ask something yes. to that? But uh, it doesn't mean that uh, a mental answers that maybe the mind is giving to that question, they are not important. Important is to be uh, thrown into oneself, or... Can I say this? Yes, y yes, you can say this, it like this, because every answer is not really true. So we, c we can name it consciousness, awareness, the divine, the space in which is everywhere. So these are just names. And in this question, who am I, in my experience is somehow hidden this movement to give an answer, to name it, And I found another question which I actually prefer to investigate how, how is that what I am? In my experience, then, it comes much more into aliveness. Then it's not so... mental. So, right now, somehow it's clear that I am here. Whatever it is, what I am. So, but I am here because I am aware of experiences here. Camera and talking, colors, thoughts, feelings. And I am aware of it. So when I know that I'm not that what I'm aware of, because for me it's if there is no spiritual concept, it's clear that I'm not what I see, eh? this glass of water, or this camera, or this person. So what I am is something different. It's also not this, because also that's what I see, and what I can explore through sensations. And when this sensation is finished, I'm still here. So I, that what I really am must be something else. And so when I let go, for example, of these experiences, of the thoughts and the feelings, and they don't need to stop, because they just are happening. But when I look, what remains when these 
thoughts, feelings, sensations don't get the attention then I can explore that what remains. Can you put in word what remains for you? What you found out? I found out that that what remains is absolutely peaceful, absolutely silent, absolutely free, absolutely unconditional, it is without any need, without any stress, it is just wonderful when the attention comes there. When I saw that for the first time in my life, suddenly all the search for enlightenment was at the end. There was no need for enlightenment, no need for anything. It was just... Finally, that what I always wanted to experience. Before it was hidden in some promises that I can experience that maybe in relationship or maybe in success in my profession or in the family life. But there were many conditions. But that what remains is absolutely unconditional. It doesn't go away. It is not angry. It has no moods. And now I say, when I speak, I speak about it and it looks like that I speak about something which is somewhere, has nothing to do with me, but this it is who I am, it's really me. And because we are using language, and the language is like me and you and some action in between that. I speak like this, yeah? but it, that what remains, is not distant, it is me. Actually, it is a no it, but uh just to talk about it, yes. we say it. Ex yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just to talk about it, we, we somehow have to name it, like we can name it consciousness or whatever. And is your experience that everybody describes it in a different way, because everybody has uh, a different uh, way of seeing or feeling it? So, everybody that I met and I was exploring with these people, they all described the same. They, and it doesn't matter where this exploration happens, if it is, for example, here on Canary Islands, or if it is in Germany, or in, doesn't matter, or if it is morning, evening, night, um, it doesn't matter if there is hunger or no hunger or disease or the circumstances are really not influencing that what remains. So, and then when the attention can 
somehow grasp it a little bit. Everybody that I know describes it the same. In my experience is that some people describe it more like, for example, cool, and the other like warm, and uh, some say it's uh, yeah, it's very unpersonal, and some see it maybe more emotional. So, uh, depending on the character or whatever. Yeah, well, what they then what they then describe is again an experience, an experience that is arising when the attention comes to that what remains. And this, the experiences again, very quickly take our attention. And often, very quickly, Uh, judging is happening. And the experiences that can happen when the attention comes to that what remains can, ver can verify. But when people describe exactly that what remains, then all the people say the same, eh? it's silent. They mostly, or actually always, nobody knows something what is more silent. They say it's peaceful. They say it has no beginning and no end. They say it has no form. And it has a quality of emptiness. And when it is more explored, then also it has the quality of fullness. Because that what remains is not separate from anything. So everything that appears is happening, appearing in that what remains. So then people that are spiritually very educated or advanced say, but this is a kind of separation. And it's not so, supposed to be like that. And it's just a separation because we name it, we speak about it, and there must be separation then. And actually, I don't care about spiritual correctness. I know that who I am is not separate from anything. And also I know that who I am is not what I see. So this creates a kind of separation. But I know I'm not the glass. But I know that this glass is not separated from me. It's Directly, everything is just happening in me, in that what remains. The whole, the, the whole, everything, all that we know is happening in that. So when people get to a glimpse to know that or to experience that, can this be a hindrance then? Because, a hindrance then, because the mind wants to grab it and wants to hold it and wants to have it back when it's maybe not seen at the moment. That can, that might happen.
But right now, when your attention comes to that what remains, would you say that is happening right now also? That, that your attention has a, a glimpse of that what remains? Yes. Yes. And I ask the other people, some other people also, do you have a glimpse of that? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So, what happens when you try to get rid of, of that what remains? How successful can you be? I cannot get rid of it directly, but if I start to think about something else uh, very intensively, it may be becoming out of my uh, focus. Yes, that's what can happen. Yes, that's what can happen, yeah? that it comes out of the focus or out of the conscious exploration, so to say. But right now, when we have that knowing about the, that what remains, we can see it cannot, it cannot disappear. We cannot get rid of it. It's impossible. So, and this recognition is profound. Somehow this recognition stores in some memory in the body. And the difficulty can be then nice experiences can happen. An experience in to be peaceful or to be content or to be happy, to be joyful. And then there might happen something in life and that takes so much our focus and suddenly some different experiences there, sadness, anger, uh, despair. And often then this is interpreted as, oh, I lost it. I lost that. What we can see now, it's impossible to lose. Yeah? So this might happen. And then often it happens that, that people want to have again some nice feeling or sensation. And this feeling or sensation is mixed up with that what remains, because that what remains is not a sensation, it's not a feeling, it's not... But to describe it, we have to use somehow what we have learned, feel, feelings or thoughts or... We have to use these to describe it. And I also know out of experience that I had very blissful states and they were changing and I was thinking, oh, I lost it. And I was looking for the blissful state again, which was not up to me. And more and more I could see, okay, it's not about blissful states, peaceful states. It's nice to have them and thank you that they have been there. But that what remains, it's even, it's much more peaceful and much more blissful than any state that was um, appearing. And yes, of course, we are human beings. Yeah? Human beings have wants and needs. And these human beings want mostly what they don't have and don't want what they have. Caught suffering.
if we want to come out of suffering, we just have to discover that what remains. It doesn't mean that that what remains heals heals all these conditions, but it helps a lot. Because that what remains is a, a, a resource which is always present, always here. We can be aware of that in the darkest room, For example, the ocean is also a very good and beautiful resource. Or resource? How do you say? Resource. Resource. And but the ocean, we have to be near to it to recognize it. Eh? That what remains. There is never any distance. Um, what helps to uh, be aware of that what remains? Uh, to be together with people who have the same focus? That helps a lot, or can help a lot. that has a very good power to create a field of consciousness. What also helps a lot is to notice that I am as human being are safe here. When, when I'm safe as a human being, then it's easier to meditate. When this human being is in danger, then it's more important to survive. Then meditation is not such a good option. But mostly this organism just thinks that there is any danger, but there is no. And when this is clear, then meditation is easily possible. Meditation in this case means to be aware of that what remains. And meditation, like most people understand it, just to sit and to close their eyes and to look inside, it helps also to get what remains in the focus? It might help, yes. It might help. I don't know how what people are practicing when they sit down, close their eyes, and when the when the intention is to find out what remains, then that can help a lot. When they try to sit there and to come into a certain state, then it can be not right on the point, so to say. Um, so, what I point out again and again, it's not about any state, state of consciousness or state of awareness or however we want to call it. So I hear often people say, oh, I want endless joy. Yes, of course, <laughs> yeah. we want that. Huh? But the nature of feelings, and joy is a feeling, the nature of feelings is that they are changing. And uh, all the, or many of yeah, all the feelings belong to humanness. So we are 
human beings, or we are experiencing human beings, as I said what we are, we are experiencing human beings and they have joy and anger and sadness and fear and all that feelings. So all these feelings belong to life. If we say, I just want to be joyful, always joyful, 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 just imagine that, yeah? You have a, a friend or a partner who is always joyful, only joyful. It will be boring for very quickly. Yeah? So it's just a thought that we want to be joyful always. And I like it also to be joyful. But I also like it to be sad. I also like to explore anger, even fear, even disgust. And to see behind all that, or in, in the middle of it, there's that what remains. Silently, peacefully, unconditionally. Some people who put the intention to find out what remains, they report that they um, experience something like they call it um, the dark night of the soul. That means um, a lot of things coming up. Uh, is this also your experience? Yes. Yes. And that painful stuff that can come up now has a has space or it is okay that it shows up finally. Finally there is enough space that it can be seen and can be felt, can be experienced. I often sometimes hear people that are afraid of the dark night of the soul say, oh no, 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 I, I don't want to go there because then and I said, you are already in the midst of it. It's As soon as we are interested in truth, you could say, we are already in the midst of the dark night of the soul. Otherwise, why should we be interested in truth? Or in waking up, or in liberation, or this illusionment, or however we want to call it. So we have already recognized that, that what I'm experiencing is the dark night of the soul. And when we find out that who we really are is something what is not the experience, then these experiences can be can be observed with a little bit of distance means we are not identified with it, unconsciously identified with it. So then we can see clearer that there is a identification, there is more consciousness about this identification and more consciousness about that I am not these experiences. Now you have mentioned uh, identification. Um, some people say 
that all their identification has fallen away and other they say uh, to live in this body there must be a rest of identification with the body how is it for you yes it's it's here absolutely now here identification with um, certain things which is not a problem at all and people that say I have no identification are just in my eyes liars they lie they pretending they it's not true it because then they wouldn't even speak why should they speak or why should they even say that they don't have any identification for what then must be an identification because if you would speak to me and here wouldn't be any identification I wouldn't even notice that you speak to me and that I should answer that's how I I see it it doesn't need to be true at all that's how I see it and I saw many masters, teachers, gurus, however you want to call them, satsang leaders, dog masters, <laughs> um, they were saying this and directly after that statement I could see their identifications. In the way they were reacting to people that asked maybe questions that were not so comfortable for the master. Or started to blame the master in any way and suddenly there was a reaction happening that wouldn't happen without identification. Maybe it's also a question how the, how it's a definition of identification yes yes so there yeah and it's very important to clarify that what does it mean identification is it identification or is it attachment and these are different things different experiences just to know that uh, when somebody called Gaia that you are meant uh, to hear it and to react um, and you know you are um, asked or something uh, that doesn't mean it has to be identification it's just uh, the knowing that name is now your name I would I would call that identification mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and And I have no difficulties with identification because I know identifications are necessary for conversation or social interaction. What we want as human beings, as human beings, we want to be in contact, we want to meet, we want to to yeah, to be in contact with the world, with the sensation. And also attachment is not a... is just attachment. Hmm? Something is attached to a certain behaving pattern. Or, it's not a problem. There are anyway no problems. We just could call them like, like this. And when, when we say <coughs> you are supposed to get rid of all the attachments and all the identifications, It doesn't help to notice that what remains. We can notice it now with all the attachment and all the identification. It is not important that that stops. Also, it's not important that any thought is stopping or any feeling or any 
sein. But what I notice when we as human beings are conscious of who we are and this can radiate somehow through our expression it might help that more people can recognize it and more and more people can recognize wow um, there isn't it's something possible which also can have an influence on human beings, politicians, churches, or economic systems, money systems. It might take a while, but if it doesn't, don't start. Or if we wait, that they change and then I change, then we are in the waiting mode. You still wait for the Jesus Christ or whatever who, who can save us. Can you say in what way it is a help to feel the feelings and not to suppress them? Yes. So I know feelings and they appear through different behaving patterns of this organism as unpleasant or terrible or however we want to call them. And when we can notice here and now that for this organism right now there's no danger to be here. And then we also can explore that any feeling is not a danger. It doesn't matter how terrible it is or how beautiful. So any feeling doesn't... There is no feeling that can kill me as, as a human being. That what remains anyway cannot be killed or destroyed. But this, this human being can die or can be hurt. But feelings don't do that. Feelings are just feelings. And Slowly, slowly, we can start to be present in them and to enjoy them, maybe a little bit, just a little bit. When I have in my mind, uh, yeah, it may be good to feel the feelings, it makes me more alive, but at the moment I don't feel anything, is there a way to get more clear, clear with the feeling or more near to the feeling, to, to get it shown up. So, I know that many people have difficulties to really express what kind of feeling is right now here. Because often it's, a, it's, it's mixed up with mental processes or with emotional load or 
those inner judgments. And, but when I carefully look right now here, it's not impossible that there is no feeling. There is always some feeling. So often people say, when I ask them, how do you, or what do you feel? They say, oh, good, it feels good. But this good is not a feeling. No? Good is a judgment. And judgment in this case doesn't mean anything bad or it's just judging, mm -hmm. evaluating, you could say. So if I would describe the feelings that I'm experiencing right now, I would say it's a mixture. It's a, a mixture of feelings. And there is right now no they don't threaten me or they don't they are not uncomfortable. And mostly what when I know from from individual sessions that I was taking, trauma sessions, trauma work that it was difficult for me to, to label or to name, then it was very helpful that my therapist, if I want to call him like this, or my supporter, was asking good questions. And that I could track it better and to find out what what exactly is creating this sadness and to notice then wow it's nothing it has nothing to do with the situation right now so to recognize oh, that uh, these are old feelings and for some people it's really difficult to come in contact with feelings eh? they are there And I would never force anybody that comes to me to feel a feeling. My approach is different. What, what I, out of experience, how I learned for myself what helps me. So I would never tell somebody to feel the anger now. And now feel the anger doesn't do anything to you or feel the sadness. Sometimes we have to suppress them, eh? because it's a surviving pattern. I found for myself, I found out <clears throat> when I don't feel a feeling um, that I watch myself and uh, I watch that there is no, no feeling. The, I, I feel there's no feeling and then I can check is, it, is this more calm or more, um, more alive and then to, just to get open and then in a way Maybe the feeling is coming. And uh, if it's good, then it makes me more soft and more available and... Mm. Okay. Ah, yeah. Now, I think there's a distinction to be done. Softness or warmness or flow, I wouldn't name that as a feeling. I would say this is a sensation. So... Mm. 
we often say I feel warm or I feel in the flow or I feel to be like this it's a kind of expression of what we are losing and I notice in the work with people that when we start to notice feelings and we can be we can express it somehow, we can name it a little bit, we can start feeling it more without having the the internal feeling of threat or things like this, then when we start to be present in that feeling, then this warmth can happen or cold, whatever sensations can be recognized. Feeling, again, feeling the connectedness, but it's not feeling, it's sensing the connectedness. It's how I express it. It's not that I say, it is like this. The way how I interpret, or how I label, Feeling is more something emotional, but also there I make a distinction. The feeling is very neutral actually, the emotion mostly is loaded. So, anger that is just felt present, can be without any load. When it is in a way suppressed, then it can really show up with an aggression or with, with load. Sadness with deep crying as a load and mostly loaded in blaming. I'm so sad because you are not like that and that and that. So this is that's what I call emotional load. So the lo emotional load has something to do uh, the connection to a story behind it. Yes, story, old behaving patterns, surviving mechanisms, trauma, whatever trauma is. And also, this is a kind of definition. <laughs> So feelings of guilt, yeah, we say, for example, guilt feelings, yeah? it's not a feeling, it's a thought. It's a thought that creates a sensation of stuckness and creates a feeling of fear. fear to be punished, the thought, I am guilty, that's how I see it right now. And uh, when the feeling is suppressed, then it felt, then it becomes a sensation uh, in the body, like um, Becoming a, an anger, or the narrowness. Narrowness. Yes, it 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 can be like that. It can create diseases. It can create behaving patterns that are not nice. Yeah. And. Now can you repeat the question? I lost it. Oh, I also lost <laughs> you lost it. Also. <laughs> ah, is, uh, if the if every feeling is a sensation in the body at the same time, or only when the feeling is suppressed? To say it exactly. So all these thoughts, feelings, sensations are, are mostly okay. in a very or what mostly, I think always in a 
We are going together. So if we, for example, have strongly that surviving pattern to be always a good guy, to be loved or to be appreciated or to be seen or So, in this way of behaving, which I know very well because it was one of my surviving strategies, the things that I evaluate as not or as bad or evil or they are not allowed then. Like for, for in my case, it was anger. So the anger, but there was anger, but I, people that were angry or were aggressive or, so I mixed that up, yeah, aggression with anger, they, they were a no-go for me, people that were beating their children or their partners or whatever, they were just a no-go. So for me, also anger was, I didn't know that there was anger. So the anger in my system was so suppressed for, for surviving in the childhood that it created diseases like cancer. I had a cancer diagnosis um, in, the, in the 80s. came out in a different way. It came out in being sarcastic, sarcastical or cynical or very mental. Yeah? But I wasn't able to notice that the anger is there and doesn't belong to this person that is next to me. Yeah? I was then cynical, mostly my poor partners. And as we are lovers of love, we actually we love to love. Yeah? It's um, the most beautiful with everybody, actually. Uh, we actually we, we don't want to hurt people intentionally, but it happens so quickly yeah, when this when the anger is suppressed. How did it change for you through therapy and meditation and yes, for me it, it helped um, very much to to have to take sessions in somatic experiencing and now uh, to two methods of trauma healing and then also to study that and in the study of that work, I took many, many sessions and then I could more be present in that anger and could see where it, where it belongs to. Why I was angry, what actually made me angry and also in that time when I had the cancer, I could see that already and started, when I noticed there was anger and I could notice it a little bit to really say it, oh, that pisses me off, or that was before that it was suppressed. Huh? This expression then that pisses me off or I don't like it or whatever came out in a very aggressive way actually in that time because I was not really able to be present in that feeling caused that I divorced from my wife or she from me or who divorce happened yeah? because she was she knew me as a nice friendly guy 
who always was helping everybody and everything, so... But that helped me to survive, I think. Maybe otherwise I would have died of this cancer. I don't, I don't know, yeah, but that's how it feels like you now. And noticing that being angry or feeling anger is not bad and it doesn't say anything about me and is not bad helped to be present, to be more present in anger. And there are still, I think there are still um, deficits, do you say that like that? Deficits, yeah. yeah. Can it happen that somebody comes to you in a single session or in satsang and after some time you tell him it's nice you're coming to me, but uh, it's maybe better you first do some trauma healing. Yes. Yes, it can happen. That. So I invite everybody for satsang. Everybody is invited in satsang, however his patterns are. But when I see there's a way of approach or a way of exploring that doesn't support him or the, 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 the group in that moment, then I invite him for an individual session, maybe with me, and when I see my capacity is not good enough for them, then I would invite them to find somebody who can work um, regularly with them and who might be even more skilled than I am. Okay, I think in um, all the... Uh, what you are offering to people, like a single session or satsang, um, it's always pointing to the same, to the truth. Can this be said? It depends. It depends. Um, it depends really what the person wants when they come to the individual session. Yeah? When they come to satsang, yes, this is the, the first mm, the foreground, so to say, that I point to that what remains. This is the most important that I see in satsang. Sometimes people come, I'm using some of these tools that I have learned through somatic experiencing or NAM. But when I, when I notice it takes now too much attention, then, then I invite for individual sessions. And in the end, for us, for everybody of us, it is to notice that the danger is over. Now, so to notice that not only mentally, but also emotionally and sensationally, with the whole. And and then a kind of well-being can start to happen. I feel well here. I, or we can say I feel happy. You need the personal contact to the people to be with him or her in the same room or you do sessions also via Skype or telephone? Yes, I do also via, via Skype, telephone, Zoom, all these um, possibilities that are um, available online. Of course, the best is to, to be together directly, because there are so much signs that everybody is giving that I can pick up and maybe reflect or... In Skype mostly we see only this part of the body that I just can guess that this person maybe is moving his legs or whatever. 
then I can ask. But when I'm seeing it directly, I immediately can pick it up and maybe use that for a question to explore. That the person can see how the nerve system is starting to go into the flight or fight motors. But I do it, you know, even sometimes only with telephone where I just hear the voice, which is also good. Can be a lot of information can be in the voice. And uh, what you are saying or what you are pointing to, this comes spontaneously to you. It it is it depends what the person wants. Huh? So sometimes people come to me because they have attained a satsang and have some questions, but they have the they don't want to speak it in the public, or it's very specific, so they want to have some more clarifications and statements that I was saying. And then we do it like this. They just want to so-called wake up or to practice to more focus on that what remains. And then it's different. For example, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, um, I'm so much stressed in the relationship with, with my partner or with my boss or with my colleague and, or with my parents or whatever, and I want to have more safety there, then I, that would be a different approach. So when somebody says, I want more safety or more stability, then I would go there and look, how can we find it? Yeah? Or what is in the way to, to find stability? And then it might happen that after the session people say, wow, I'm really, I'm, my legs are here now, I'm, I'm feeling my sitting bones, I'm connected, I'm strong. Wow, yeah, that's what I wanted. So it, it really depends. Um, and uh, you're giving satsangs uh, in some period uh, once a day, like here now at La Gomera, but you're also offering retreats. Yes. Then there will happen more satsangs every day, and the people don't talk, or how, how, it, how it works? Oh, yeah. mm. Nice question. Thank you for asking that. Um, in the retreats, I have a, um, mostly I offer silent retreats, which means we are invited, all of us, we are invited to not talk so much, mostly in the breaks. And in the silent retreats, we eat together and not talking, or not talking so much, so we can ask the practical, or speak the practical, yeah? can you give me the salt, or whatever that is. And nowadays, and that has established in the last years, a retreat is, the day of a retreat looks like this, mostly in the morning, before we have the breakfast, we do a meditation means we sit together and then either I speak and guide guide people to that what remains with their attention or we're doing some healing work, meditation, different it's different. It depends also what people like and what I like also. <laughs> and after that there's the breakfast time, which is in silence, and we will have a satsang. Then there will be lunchtime. Satsang is normal, asking questions or exploring. Also that what remains, but also explore the patterns that seem to prevent us being aware of who we are, 
There will be the lunch time. After the lunch, mostly I'm available for individual sessions where we can do trauma work individually. And after that, I'm available for essential healing. It's a healing method that somehow developed and people just rest and lay down and I also guide them a little bit through the nervous system and then come to them and touch them on shoulders and head. And mostly in these healing sessions also some processes start to happen. Then we have dinner and after the dinner we have another satsang and then we go to sleep or to smoke or to drink wine or whatever, whatever is supposed to happen. And the invitation is, to, when we do that, to stay without talking. I also say the not talking doesn't help you to get enlightened, but it helps you to be more conscious about what kind of patterns are going on. And there are three days retreats or weekend retreats or one week retreats. And you're not offering retreats and satsang only in Germany, but also in uh, Romania and uh, what? Czech Republic or yes. Switzerland or Austria or Spain now. <laughs> It depends uh, where people invite you and yes. where you have a good feeling. Or? Yes. 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 I mostly go just for invitation. Only the retreats I'm organizing myself. And but yeah, I go where it is easy and where people really want me to be there and are supporting that, that also some people come there. And for me it's not important to have a place and come many people, it's, it's not really important. I more, much more appreciate the quality of meeting. And there can be satsangs just with five people or there can be satsangs with 25 people, but that is not so important for me. And the language is never a problem? Uh, you, are, you are translate in these countries, somebody translates what you are saying? Some people translate, but they are translating is sometimes a difficulty. Even when we speak, speak uh, one language, language can be already a difficulty. And when it is translated, for example, in, into Czech language, where I just know some words, I have no idea. Sometimes in the reaction of the people, I can notice, okay, that what I have said and what the translator understood, and then what he was saying was not what I meant. <laughs> so, but yeah, that, that is happening sometimes. And yeah. But, yeah, mostly then in these countries I speak English because most interpreters um, prefer English. But sometimes also German is possible. But you feel good in these countries. You don't feel like a stranger or something. You are, you are happy also there. You, you like it when the people are alive and... What I like is... when people... see and receive a way of healing and to then to be together with them and being um, yeah to be there and see what happens yeah and see suddenly when they see wow how great is that or ah oh, suddenly so much pressure is falling away from me or and just to be present in that is that's my joy. I, I love it to see that happening. 
and and this can be in every country so yeah it can be in every country and you enjoy traveling and staying at the different places and atmospheres and culture not always but mostly you know, sometimes i don't want sometimes i say ah i prefer to sit on my sofa at home and watch television uh, to, <laughs> to be with my girlfriend or with my children or my grandchildren or things like this so i'm still a normal person and but when there's when the travel starts and it's happening then, then i like it i like it. Everything, all that is happening. But sometimes also the mind says, "Oh, I prefer to have a different experience." So we have the mind. <laughs> you are friendly with your mind. I'm. I love it. I love the mind. And yes, I love it. It's beautiful. The mind is wants to help always, and it is so innocent. So I notice sometimes people experience, "Wow, it's so easy." I don't have to do anything. It's just there. And maybe ten seconds later the question comes, how can I keep that? And then I see the innocence of the mind. Yeah? The, the mind wants to help always, even when there is no help needed. It's, it's just lovely. <laughs> I just, I just when I said, oh, sometimes I just want to sit home and, or stay home and um, watch TV. I saw her face. Hmm? How can you say that now? <laughs> How can he be so <laughs> anti, anti enlightened? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love soccer. Yeah, I saw on your timetable something like uh, a world championship satsang or something. Was it a joke or what does it mean? Yes, it's, it's a kind of joke and a kind of my humor. But when the soccer championships will be in summer, I took this time to not travel somewhere and to watch all the games that I want to watch. And in between, I offer if people want to come for individual sessions to come there, and I call that the championship satsang. <laughs> It's my strange kind of humor. Okay. Is there any other um, aspect, no, um, issue you like to talk about? <clears throat> um, it's coming, it's coming nothing from my side. Maybe some of you have some thing that can be spoken about, but I'm fine with this interview. Okay, then. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you also.
Namaste. Namaste means actually not thank you. Namaste means just I appreciate that what remains. Because that is in you and in me and in everything. <laughs> 